So, Seamus, I I hear you have an announcement for us this week. Yeah. So, before the T-virus swept through the world and zombified everyone, do you remember the before time when the world was, like, normal and people used to go outside? Yeah, yeah. I, I used to have to go to work and stuff. Yeah. Thank goodness for this apocalypse. Anyway... Um, my state has opened back up and we have resumed our search for a house. And that search lasted for two days and then we found a house. So this is excellent. Happening. Yeah. It was, it was so quick. It was like, oh, we're gonna start visiting houses and doing home inspections again. It sucks. It just sucks so bad, and this is gonna drag on forever. Oh wait, no, wait, we found one. We're we're done. This is happening. We have a closing date. So this is all really good news. Um, this is just yeah. It it'll be nice to have a real house. We're right now we're in a second floor apartment, and we're gonna have a house, and that will be very nice for us and. But this is all happening very quickly. And so we're going to spend a lot of this month moving. I'm going to try and keep the content mill grinding. We'll see how I do amongst the chaos. Yeah, that, that certainly consumes a lot of time. Right, right. Now, last time we moved, it was this excruciating thing where I could not get the cable company to get me on the internet in a timely manner. And it was like almost a full week of no internet. And that was just, it made me absolutely crazy. We're going to see if we can do it better this time. Are you setting it up in advance or what's the internet like where you live? Uh, we get our internet through our cable company, you know, TV cable. And they are always confused when I contact them and it's like, you know, I'm calling about my service. And they're like, you know, what packages do you have? Do you have ESPN? Do you want ESPN? I'm like, I, I, we don't do television. I don't buy television. They cannot fathom the idea that somebody buys internet and not television. That's like going to McDonald's and buying fries and no burger. They just don't know how to cope with that. It's, it's like, well, why would you, why would you want to have information if it didn't come through a television? Right, right. <laughs> you just can't. Uh, it's it's like the spam sketch from Monty Python, where they just like, oh, you don't get the television. You just have this regular television package. You don't have the television television package. No, no, no. I don't have the television pack. Oh, you have the you have the the just the time just the basic television television package. <laughs> So anyway, we're going to have to wrestle with those idiots who seem to think that the internet is this weird afterthought for for strange people and not, you know, one of the critical utilities that drive our lives. <laughs> so I don't know what's going to happen over the next month. It's going to be very hectic for me. I'm going to try and keep the content going up here on the site. We'll see how well I do. I noticed it was a little slow this week already, so is that a symptom already showing up? Uh, probably. It's it's hard to tell. <laughs> it's like, well, a lot's going on. How much of this do I blame on the move? I don't know. It's, um, yeah. I'm, I'm really, really happy. I'm going to have a nicer office. I'm going to have an office with a wood floor. I, roller chairs on on carpet sucks. Yeah, it doesn't work so well. Do you have one of those carpet protector things, like the big plastic sheets? I, I do, but they just, like, fall apart. Like, you know, you put it down on top of carpet, and then you can roll your chair around on it. And they always, I've gone through so many, they, like, last a year and a half. And it's like, okay, we'll get a good one this time, we get a good one, and it lasts, you know... A year and seven months instead of and I'm like what is it with these things I know these things live in offices for decades before they need to be replaced 
but why why do these just they crack they shatter they fall apart they get weird I, I don't know what I'm doing wrong is it this carpet I have no idea but it, it's just always this horrible headache of like oh no now my the mat that my chair rolls around on has this big crack in it and it's coming apart and I end up rolling on carpet and fussing around and taping it back together and get another one and I'm just so sick of it and I'm like oh I just want to pull up the carpet and roll around on the perfectly good wood floor underneath this annoying carpet but you can't do that because it's a rental and the the owner would be very upset if I just threw away his carpeting <laughs> <laughs> just tear it all out throw it away hey i did you a service now my chair works properly <laughs> right <laughs> right i'm sure that won't raise an eyebrow so i will be able to make the space mine in a way that we could not before we might paint one of the walls green green screen paint um if i ever do Ooh. streaming again you know that that'll be really nice so you don't have to have one of those you know stupid screens that you store and then you put it behind you and you just have a wall that's green movie bob does that it seems like it'd be super convenient anyway that's what's going on so if i vanish for days at a time i'm not dead i'm moving so how are things going in paul land playing any good games the Paul Land uh, is pretty normal, except for today when I was like, you know what, I'm going to play some video games. I'm going to go on GOG and see what's up. And they had a few things for sale, one of which was Noita, which I think we talked about on the diecast before. Yeah, I've nearly bought that game so many times. That's the one where every pixel was simulated. Yeah, it's a pixel physics game. Yeah, I've almost bought it so many times. Like, it, I don't like the idea of... I'm, I'm not super in love with roguelikes. I play them once in a while, but, you know, they're sometimes frustrating. And But I love the idea of the gameplay and, and the pixel physics simulation. Yeah, it's it's very fun. I've, um, I've been enamored, I suppose, of pixel physics games for a long time, ever since I started... Uh, what was it? Well, I guess it was Scorched Earth was one of the first pixel physics game uh, we talked about last week, that uh, that tank game. Oh, right, right. It wasn't exactly physics, but it was, you know, you'd blow up the side of the mountain, and then if it was in dirt instead of rock, like, the little pixels would fall down. It's like, whoa, that's so cool, it's, you know, a simulation. Right. Our, our standards for simulation were very loose back then. And uh, then I used to do, like, it wasn't animation, but it was like, I would make things in, in well, Microsoft Paint. So I'd build bases, you know, draw bases out and draw all the, the cables that were connecting the generator to the guns or whatever. Yeah. And uh, so then I think the first game I really played that, that had pixel physics in it was Cortex Command. I don't, have you played that one before? I have I don't think so. I'll look it up. Tell me about it. Yeah, so Cortex Command came out oh maybe a decade ago. And um it's got a lot of kind of weird, quirky features like like the arms and legs of the characters that you're um that you're playing as. You you command a bunch of different characters, a bunch of different uh robots, basically. And bodies. Okay, so, and just, a, so like Yeah. It's a side scroller. It looks kind of like weird Terraria. Yeah, yeah. This is before there was, uh, before there was Minecraft, I think. Okay, yeah. So this is old. Yeah, and uh, and this guy put this together. This uh, this game. So you, you play as like a disembodied brain, and so you can control all these different bodies, and you can order them. And so like when you order a body, it doesn't just show up. It, it gets sent down from the, the orbital platform, and so there's like a rocket, and there's physics on the rockets, and the rockets have rocket engines, and, and they fire to, to maintain orientation. It's a very involved simulation. 
and uh, and you get goofy stuff where like you know the enemy's robot is coming down in his rocket and you shoot one of the side engines and it spins out of control because you know it only has one engine now and or you know the the engine gets disconnected and flies off on its own and stuff like that. Cool. Yeah. Uh, but it didn't really have fluid simulation. It was all just um, like rigid body kind of stuff. And then if you shot something enough, it would break into to little little pieces. And one of the things I really loved about the Cortex Command was that it was really really moddable. You, I think all the game logic was in what was it, Lua? Right. Okay. Have you, I mean, have I don't you know, but that Lua sounds. Before? I've never programmed in Lua. I've done a. I've. I've nearly learned Lua like a dozen times. Every time I'm, I go to mod <laughs> a game or fuss with it, I'm like, oh, this uses Lua. Cool. Another game that uses Lua. Oh, look, here's another game. Like Lua is super, super common. I assume that um, we we joked about it uh, a few weeks ago about like, well, why can't games offer mods that are perfectly safe? I believe Lua is sandboxed, so you can't just like write a script to, you know, steal the player's info or whatever. Like, I believe it's, right. it's cordoned off. It's like a, an interpreted language, I think. Right, right. Well, I mean, a lot of languages are interpreted. I mean, to a certain extent, I believe Python is interpreted. But I believe Python, if you just, like, add it as, you know, to your to your game if you just give the user oh yeah you could just run python scripts in this game then they can do a lot of shenanigans to your computer right exactly because because that's a uh unbounded language or something lou is i think designed for for scripting anyway uh the the cool thing that I did in, in Cortex Command was I reprogrammed the rocket so that they actually, there was a homing rocket weapon, but the homing code didn't account for gravity. And so I basically just hacked it in to, to account for gravity so that the homing rockets would actually hit things that you're targeting. Cool. And of course, then you do a bunch of goofy stuff, make hand grenades that spawn other hand grenades and you know, stuff like that. Guns that shoot rockets, not like not like rocket launch rockets, but like entire spaceship rockets. <laughs> a gun that shoots a rocket. That's amazing. So that was a fun game. So then when I saw Noida, uh, I forget who, who recommended it to us. I think one of our... our um, Correspondence? What, what is that? With our uh, the diecast mailbag people. Mailbaggers is, I believe, the accepted term. And one of the mailbag ladies got us uh, a pointer to Noita, and it was like, "Whoa, this is great! Like it's it's all the stuff from Cortex Command, all the the rigid body stuff, plus fluids and gases and smoke and stuff." Right. Yeah. The the. The gases is the one I find most fascinating. Simulating gases. Like, that's... you Gases, I, a lot of people probably don't know this, but gases move pretty fast. <laughs> yeah. It's like, when you see water simulated in video games, it's usually, like, sort of blobby. Like, it's, you know, simulating this very thick corn syrup. Um, but, yeah, when you start simulating stuff like liquids and gases, it's, you know, liquids that behave more like thin water. You've got to do, like, I'm watching some Noida footage now, and it's just, wow, that's a lot of individual particles that you need to update every single frame. That's pretty good. Yeah, and it's it's all procedurally generated, so you can't even bake it into the level. It's got to come right. up with it every time. And it can get away from you. You can just put a hole in the in the floor, and the liquid can start flowing everywhere. And it's like, well, so you have to run this liquid simulation over a large area, and check for collision over large area. Wow, it's just so interesting. 
Like, even on modern computers, this seems like it would be, it would require some, some power, some real processing power. It's yeah, not it just does like, hitch occasionally uh, when yeah. I'm playing it. it. It slows down a little. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's just because it's in development and they haven't optimized it yet, or if it's, it's just, it's processing too much stuff and it, it can't handle it. Or if it's because I'm also playing YouTube videos in the background at the same time. I've been having a lot of fun with it. It's a very cool game, uh, just from a, a roguelike perspective. A lot of roguelikes, you start off and it's like, okay, the same old thing over again, uh, you know, boring first level, and uh, right. you got to get to the second level or the third level before it really gets interesting. And uh, as far, I mean, I haven't played a lot. I've only played maybe four or five hours so far. And, uh, but so far, the first level is is still interesting. There's still like, well, you know, what kind of uh, wand, magic wands. So the, the system is based on you get these magic wands, you've got four slots for wands and then four slots for items. And the magic wands have slots in them that you can configure in the, the um, what is it, the in-between level. Like when you beat a level, then you're in this like in-between level where you can buy stuff and you get your health and stuff back. Oh, interesting. And like what what can you do? like? What can these wands do other than just shoot fireballs, which is what I see in most of the footage I have here. Yeah, well, so uh, the wands have a number of of properties. They're uh, they have a cooldown, so like how long it takes between when you cast a spell. So each spell has a cooldown, and then the wand has a cooldown modifier, and then it's got a. It's a complicated system. Anyway, the main thing is that they've got slots, so you can have a wand with three slots, and you can put three spells in there. And then uh, when you click the button, when you, you, you've got the wand out, it'll fire the first spell, and then the next spell, and then the next spell, and it'll refresh. Um, and so when you find them, they just have some spells in there. And uh, usually it's like a whole bunch of one kind, or uh, one or two of a certain kind, or maybe one or two that have a limited number of uses. But then when you go in between the levels, you get to rearrange all that stuff. So you can take all the spells out of all your wands and rearrange them all and, and configure them how you want. And some of the spells are modifiers that change how other spells behave. So like they'll make the spells fly further or make them explode when they hit something or things like that. Very cool. Yeah, every time I every time I see footage of this game, I'm like, oh, this looks so interesting. I've got to try it. You'll see somebody you know they'll they're running around and they get under a giant pool of some glowing liquid and you know i don't play the game so i don't even know what it is but they'll punch a hole in the bottom of this reservoir and it'll begin flowing out and then something catches on fire and the fire spreads and you know the ground is is crumbling away and you're like oh this is absolutely crazy this is amazing i should play this and then i wander away and don't think about it yeah, it was on sale. Game. I don't know if it's still going to be, but it was on sale for 20% off. I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to stick my toe in the pool. And turns out the pool is made of uh, acid. That's what the glowing stuff is. Oh, well, that's terrifying. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of uh, stuff where the game will give you enough rope to hang yourself, so to speak, where it's like, oh, here's this right. wand. And like, what does it do? Well, it's a, it's a wand of acid burst it's like cool click and it's like it's an acid burst centered on you and it's like fills the whole screen and now you're dead <laughs> <laughs> do you know what a wand's gonna do before you before you use it uh roughly if if you've seen the wand before like if you've seen the spells in the wand right. before you have an idea of what it's gonna do but if it's got spells that you don't know what they are or if it's got a bunch of modifiers where it's like it's not exactly clear how they're all going to interact. You just got to kind of try it out. Okay, but it's not like it deliberately... Here's a blue wand. You don't know what it does until you pull the trigger and it might kill you. It doesn't do that. Once you know Correct. the game... Correct. It does not you... do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it exposes all of the things that are on the wand once you, you get to pick it up. Um, but because you only have four slots and there's maybe like five or six of these wands on each level... You don't find them all, or you don't have to find them all, but you could potentially, you know, 
completely refresh your entire inventory of, of magic wands and have completely different ones. And then you also have a, a spell inventory, so you can take the spells out of the wands and put them in your inventory so that you can put them back in later at a different, you know, if you beat the level and then you've got this inventory of things or if you're saving them for something that's... I, I don't understand this the high level strategy yet, but I'm sure there's, there's some amount of strategy. Like, one of the things is that if you have... So when you get to the, the in-between level where you get refreshed on, on spell charges and health, um, it doesn't automatically do that for you. It's got a couple of pickups, and they're right in the way, so you can, you know, you just walk over them. But you can also jump over them and go and get new wands, and then use those wands a little bit, and then come back and get the refresh. And so it's like it rewards you a little bit for thinking about the order that you do things in. Interesting. So is there a win state to the game, or is this just one of those games where it's like, go as long as possible? Uh, it, it it has a win state, um, ostensibly. It, it tells you how many times you've won ever, and uh, that number's still at zero for me. And then there's a, another game mode, it's like super hardcore or something, that only unlocks once you beat the game. Um, I don't know how difficult it is to beat the game, it might be like you know, dungeon crawl games where you're lucky if you beat it once or twice. Right, Spelunky is a classic example for me. Like, for me, as somebody who's not particularly good at platforming, uh, Spelunky is borderline impossible. I think I have I got as far as, like, the second or third dungeon in Spelunky. And those are the easy ones. Yeah. Uh, you mean the second, the second or third like group of dungeons? Because that's like yeah, level yeah. fifteen, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. I was like, yeah, man, the, you never the... even got out of the first. Right. No, I got to the third, like whatever you call the the look of the dungeon changed, and uh, and I think there's two more after that, and they get way harder as you get close to the end. Like I've I've seen. I think let's that's how far I got to. Yeah, I've seen Let's Plays at the end of the game, and I'm like, oh, wow, I'm glad I quit playing this game, because I definitely do not have the skill to conquer this. Yeah, it's for me, the the archetypical dungeon crawl is Linley's dungeon crawl, uh, which is like a, a dot hack kind of style game, or a rogue, I guess, style game, uh, top-down ASCII graphics. Right. So how and I only beat that one oh. because I was save scumming. <laughs> right, I I save. Somebody asked this in the comments, and I didn't answer it at the time. In my post on Dark Souls, where I said, you know, I can't handle setbacks, and somebody said, well, you're a huge fan of of NetHack. Uh, yeah, the answer to that is, I save scum. But it's interesting how often. Um, not use it. Like, I'll die and then I'll just stop playing. But if I have the option to keep going, it I don't get as angry. That's just really interesting. Like, like I play Minecraft in hardcore mode. If I die, I quit playing. But I don't play in the enforced hardcore mode, you know, where the game immediately deletes your save. And I could tell I would get infuriated if if I died in that mode. But having the option to continue playing sort of ablates the anger, even if I don't use the option, right? Even if I'm like, okay, I'm dead and I'm just gonna let that happen and and abandon the game. But I don't get as angry if if I don't have to quit playing. That's a very interesting little quirk of that. Yeah, you don't feel like the toy's being yanked out of your hand. It's like you get right. to put it down on your own terms. Yes! That's a really good way of describing it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really what makes me mad, is like, oh, I'm trying to beat this boss. I'm like, no, you failed! Now go do something else. You've had enough fighting this boss. I'm like, no, I think I'm figuring... I'm just about to figure this out. I want to try... No, go do this other thing now. You should have beaten it. And, oh, I just get so bad. Like, I get mad describing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
there aren't that many bosses in, well, as far as I've found. Actually, okay, so so the only run that I've ever seen a, an actual boss type creature on, uh, I died and then while I was sitting there, the game just keeps running, like you've died and it's got the little screen up and you've got your statistics and stuff. But the game's still running in the background, because why not? And this, <laughs> this giant worm thing, spoilers for Noida, I guess, this giant worm thing like comes out of the ground and like chews through the earth and like is floating around, kind of like the um, the Nidhogger kind of worm guy in, in Good Robot, right? Where it goes, just goes right yeah. through the terrain. Yeah, yeah. Only in this one, it's like actually destroying the terrain. And uh, I was like, oh man, I I was not prepared to fight that guy, apparently. So how do you One of the... How, I, I have to know, because I'm watching somebody play it now, uh, Let's Play or something, and they've been on the one level for this entire conversation. I'm like, what is this person's goal? How do you beat a level? Uh, you go to the bottom, more or less. You go all the way to the bottom, and there's oh, like okay. a glowing purple portal thing if he's if he's on one of the earlier levels he might be intentionally trying to explore the whole level to get all the the stuff to pick up all the pickups and the the level ups and things um i see i because because at that at that difficulty it, there's not a great deal of danger uh especially if you're good at it unlike me where usually what i do on the first levels i go right down to the bottom find the exit portal and then kind of make expeditions upward a little ways until my health gets too low for comfort and then i go through huh well i don't know if they're early in the game but they just died so you have failed me person doing this let's play <laughs> were the were the foes uh like skeleton kind of things or were they like people with guns they were, I don't know, just looked like monsters to me. Just random blobby okay. monsters. Yeah. So I don't know. One of the, the most fun uh, times I had with it was I was... Uh, oh, and when you, when you beat a level, you also get uh, to select one of three random power-ups that increase something about your character. So... Uh, the one I selected in this playthrough, in this particular one, was um, Glass Cannon, I think. And it, it gives you a maximum of, normally your health is 100, it gives you a maximum of 50 health, but all your explosions are bigger and you're, you're, uh, you do like five times more damage or something crazy like that. And then uh, when I got into the level, I picked up a wand that, that shoots dynamite. And dynamite has a, a decent sized explosion, but with the Glass Cannon thing, uh, it was so powerful that it would just barely get far enough away that it wouldn't kill me when I shot it. <laughs> and so I was having a great, great time because this thing had like 25 shots on it, in it. And uh, normally you get like three bombs. And so this was a ton of ammo. And I was just like, okay, well, I'll just, you know, get to the edge of a cliff and uh, toss a, a stick of dynamite down there. Boom, everything is dead. And just you know, float down. You have a um, like a jetpack kind of thing. So you just float down and right. you know, pick up all the gold. Everything's great. And uh, then I, I found the exit portal. And as I was as I was walking toward the exit portal to get to the next level, I shot a piece of dynamite behind me and it bounced off the wall and was not far enough away. <laughs> and just like completely destroyed me. It was amazing. But it I don't know. I don't know if it's like this for everyone, but for me... I feel like it was my fault when I die in Noida, because it's like, oh yeah, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have been that careless. Or, oh yeah, I, I knew that guy was dangerous. Oh I, yeah, my health was low. I should have been looking for the portal instead of hunting for treasure. And you know, it it, uh, it doesn't feel too punishing, at least not yet. Maybe when I get really good at it, and you know, it'll be like, oh man, and, you know, the RNG got me. But uh, it's been a, it's been a real fun time so far. Cool. Well, based on your description. I am, I have purchased the game. I'm currently installing it. <gasps> Fun. So there you go. There's more. I should have looked for it on GOG. Oh, no, it's using Steam Early Access. Uh, Steam's the right place to get it. Yeah, this is oh, something. Yeah. I, yeah, it's... um. This is all too common is if a game is doing regular updates and it's on both GOG, GOG is my preferred platform, but 
if a game is being continually updated, I want to get it on Steam because I don't know why, but it's just terrible. Like the the releases on GOG always, always trail behind Steam by weeks. Now, if it's just one game that did that, I would assume all oh, the developers aren't pr prioritizing GOG. But because this is pervasive everywhere, every game I've ever, you know, looked at that was doing the early access or regular updates or whatever you call it, um, that was on both platforms, it was always like the GOG platform was always a couple weeks behind the Steam platform. And I, I suspect maybe there's some sort of bureaucratic interference on GOG. Like, oh, they have to review it for a couple weeks. You can't just, like, make something live right away. There, there must be some oh, sort yeah. of thing slowing it. That's all I can think of. Because somebody would keep their, you know, as a developer, that would annoy me really bad to have the different versions of my game out of sync. So I'm getting error reports for two different versions of the game. That would absolutely make me bonkers. You know, I want everything to be on the same version all the time. And I assume other developers are the same way. So the only explanation I can think of is there's something about the way GOG pushes updates that makes it slow. That is odd. I, I bought my copy on GOG, but... Uh, so far it's been fine, I guess. Who knows? Huh. There was another game I was interested in this week. I forget the name of it. And I was like, oh, I'm going to buy this. And I clicked over to GOG and the comment thread, the only com I wanted, I wanted to see what people thought of it before I put my money down. And the only discussion I saw was everybody over and over asking, Hey, is this available for down? When is this available? It's available on Steam for download. Why can't we download it here on GOG? Does anybody know when it's going to actually <laughs> no. release on GOG? And I'm like, damn it, I already went through this with Strafe and with uh, No Man's Sky, and it was super annoying. Strafe would get this huge content update, and then it would be like a month later I'd get it on, on GOG. Ugh. Well, I was hoping that, that Steam would have some real competition, but it's it's hard to beat uh, an entrenched and fairly competent uh, monolith. With deep pockets, yeah. Very hard to beat. All right, so would you like to hear about the latest DRM stupidity? Oh, yeah. I'm down for some outrage. So... As part of, you know, we're talking about live service games, and Doom Eternal is one such game. And they're planning on rolling out some sort of multiplayer, or maybe it's out now, I don't know, whatever. But they needed some anti-cheat. So they went with Denuvo anti-cheat. Now this is different than Denuvo's anti-piracy, you know, anti-tamper DRM. This is different. It's a totally different pro product from the same company of absolute jerks. So this thing installs itself at the kernel level. Uh, how... Is that allowed? How do you even... Right? Doesn't... How, like, how dare you? No, it does this, and it might mention it in the EULA, but it doesn't, like, make it clear to the user. Like, if you don't know what's... I might mention it in the U EULA, but I think people just found out about it. And it gets in there deep, and it's hard to get rid of. And as soon as I read that, I immediately went to the Bethesda store and just uninstalled the entire Bethesda store, terrified that this thing was going to start fucking with the kernel of my operating system. And the thing is, this is anti-cheat for multiplayer games. I'm never going to play the Doom multiplayer. I play it single player. 
and he just gave it to everybody. No option. It's not like, oh, you want to play online with other people, then you have to install this this thing in the kernel of your. There was just no. Uh, it just like, oh, here we did this to you. Good luck undoing it. So I just opened up Bethesda store and uninstalled the entire storefront just to be absolutely safe that this thing would never get installed on my computer. Ugh, um, wow. There was, yeah, that's scary. That is so scary. I don't want, you know, something like that can go wrong and brick your computer. You have to reinstall Windows. And that would, I mean, when that happens, that costs me days of productivity. It takes me so long to get everything installed again. And I'm not I'm not willing to risk that for anti-cheat for a multiplayer game that I'm never going to play because it's attached to a single player game that I didn't even like that much. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it seemed no weird that that this thing is like it's assuming that you're always going to be engaging with the multiplayer like it would be nice if i just didn't have to install multiplayer at all because like why do i want to download all that content right no there was enough of a backlash that they took it back out and they said all right we're going to look for a way to make it so that campaign players that that's their way of referring to single players um normal doom players that is, normal players uh don't have to install the anti-cheat but they are going to implement some sort of anti-cheat for their multiplayer thing yet i don't even think the multiplayer was out yet this is just part of their root their roadmap was oh yeah we're step one root kit everybody's machine step two roll out the multiplayer in stages and stages whoa 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 <laughs> What are you doing? This is so terrible, so terrible. And I I I'm terrified to install the Bethesda store. I am really glad I got this game on the Bethesda storefront. I mean, I'm not really glad because the Bethesda storefront is a trash fire. But it was nice to just be able to go to, without having to open any, like, think of it, if I got it on Steam, this could have been installed in the background without me knowing. But I, you know, because I have Steam running all the time. But I don't have the Bethesda storefront run, running all the time. So I was able to just uninstall it without starting it, if you see what I mean. Right. Right, so that saved me from getting it on this stupid storefront that I don't use for anything else kept um, Doom Eternal in its own little sandbox where it wasn't just going to auto-update into this horribleness. I assume, I mean, you can't install something like that without a, do you want to let this program update your computer um, permission box pops up, whatever those are. The, you know, escalating permissions. Certainly seems like. So it seems like it can't be installed in the... Like, some games will just update in the background. You know, you just, like, come back to Steam, and it's like, oh, I updated the scheme when you were gone. Oh, nice. But you can't... It wouldn't be able to install something like De Nuvo Anti-Cheat in the background. I assume. Maybe it just, you know, when it installed the first time, it got enough permissions that it doesn't need... It doesn't need additional permissions to do stuff to you... Uh, on subsequent updates I actually don't know I actually don't know if you installed the game as administrator and gave it administrator privileges could it just later modify your kernel without asking I don't know with you know new a totally new program I don't know say so in the comments if you have any guesses about how this works and if you had this installed on your machine did you get did it have to ask for permissions? I'm very curious about I'm sure somebody out there had this installed on their machine. It, I, it seems like there was another thing that it was pretty recent about, like, anti-cheat software installing at Ring Zero or something. Was that, was that League of Legends? 
Um, I have not heard anything about League of Legends or, or anything else like this recently. That doesn't mean it hasn't happened, but I haven't heard about it. Yeah, I I don't I don't remember what the what the details were, but there was some other thing about like security compromising anti cheat software, and that's the thing is like anti cheat software has always been kind of a borderline gray hat, you right. know, on the level of like the antivirus pop ups that show up when you're trying to find a driver, right. And it always struck me as being a lot like DRM. Like, the people who really want to cheat can probably get around this stuff. Well, or or the people who really want to prevent people from cheating need to have the kind of access that cheaters are okay with putting on their PC. Right. I mean, you can't just do nothing about it, or it'll just destroy your community. And it does, like, if somebody wants to cheat at a game, it's it's good to at least make them work to do it. I can understand the need for some sort of anti-cheat, so that you can't just casually do it. Just install baby's first, you know, cheat. Just install Cheat Engine on your isolated computer and have it and have it, you know, win the game for you. At least make the user work for it by installing whatever anti-anti-cheat is out there. And then make them go out to the sketchy websites and, and risk their computer to take down your anti-cheat. I'm, I'm okay with that, but then it's easy for me to be okay with that because I don't play multiplayer games. I might be more salty about it if I was a huge, like... PvP player and I had to install all this anti-cheat all the time. Yeah. And, and from what I can tell, uh, if you install cheat software, you're very, very likely to be compromised. Like, so, so the only people who are, who this is going to be actually, actually hurting is the people who aren't using cheat software. Like, you know, you're either compromising your your soft your your computer by installing cheat software, or you're getting your computer compromised by the people preventing people from installing cheat software. <laughs> right, right. It's so goofy. It seems like it would be pretty straightforward to to like be able to label suspicious behavior. Like, sure, you can't tell for sure if someone's cheating, but Certainly, they've got some sort of a clue of like, okay, well, you know, this guy's uh, only been playing for 10 minutes and he's a perfect shot and, you know, or whatever the situation is, right? Right. You should be able, especially if they're using an aimbot in an online shooter, it's incredibly easy. I mean, easy for a human to detect aimbot behavior. Oh, look, you're just drilling this person in the head, perfect accuracy at a distance. Instantly, you know, you don't miss. You're just snapping to their head and shooting over and over. Even the world's most skilled players don't do that. But then you get into then you get into the cat and mouse game of uh, making the cheat program smarter. And I don't know how far this went, but it seems like it should be fairly trivial to um, make your cheat software not so brazen about it. Like, have it just nudge me a little when I'm close, but if I'm way off, let me miss. Like, taking an already good player and turning them superhuman. Uh, like, I know in the old days, um, the Quake bot, the Quake, Quake or Quake 2, some, sometime in the late 80s, that you would have some sort of software that ran, I guess, between your game, it was modifying packets as they left your computer, right? It's monitoring traffic, it knows where everything is, it looks at the positions of everybody else in the world, and then when you pull the trigger in your game, it takes your packet, outgoing packet, saying which way you're headed, you know, where you're aiming, and modifies it to be exactly where the foe is. And maybe that's not how it's done anymore. But I remember that was the that was the 
the metagame back in the late 90s, the last time I, like, heard about this in detail and paid any attention to it, because that's the last time I played online shooters <laughs> for any length of time. And I don't know where it's It seems it's like there's got to be a lot of ways to do it, right? But what I'm right. saying is that it seems like certainly there's a whole range of things you have to be looking out for as a, a game developer doing multiplayer, trying to prevent your community from being completely overrun by cheaters and bots. But it seems like you'd be able to at least do a first pass of like, this seems suspicious. And then you just send the DRM to those guys, just send the anti-cheat software to those people and be like, hey, look, what you're doing, either you're super good or you're a little bit suspiciously too good but we want you to install this thing. If you don't, it's fine. You just have to sit out for a day or whatever, right? Like, give them an option. And then the people who are just normal old schlubs who are who are garbage at the game, you don't need it because obviously they're not cheating. The other way you could do it, if you really wanted to respect the user's sovereignty over their computer, is just offer them the option. Like, Okay, do you want uh, do you want to play on the protected servers or the unprotected servers? And the unprotected servers are the Wild West. People could be using b b brazenly using aimbots on these servers, but you don't have to install anything on your computer. You can just go and play. Or if you want to play in a secure environment where you have a reasonable expectation that everybody else is playing fairly, then you got to install this horrible thing on your computer. It's up to you. Um, that seems yeah, like that the makes most sense. Yeah, the most so you get their consent, but you know consent is necessary to play in this protected environment. That seems like the best way all around, and the cheaters can just go and try and out cheat each other in their wild west. Like that would give an outlet for people <laughs> who want to play around with cheat software and might even keep them from messing with. Oh, if I'm gonna cheat, like. Oh, do I want to go to the extra work of trying to hack my way around this anti-cheat software so I can play on the safe servers? No, I can already cheat as much as I want on these open servers. So I'm not going to go to the extra effort. And so it might like put all the cheaters in this horrible sandbox with each other where they can cheat each other all day. Yeah. Well, that and the people, your, those of your customers who want to play multiplayer but also care about the continuity of their computer security. Right. Oh yeah, those people too. But those people are in a tough spot. What do you want to do? You don't want cheaters, but you also don't want anything on your computer, and you want to play online multiplayer with strangers on the internet. You th Those goal, those three goals are incompatible, and you got to decide where you're going to sacrifice. But it puts the decision in their hands, where they want to sacrifice. True. How about we do some, some a mailbag before we wrap this up? All right. Hi, Hi Seamus. I was listening to your recent diecast where you talk about buying Civilization VI with that weird coupon from Civilization V. Um, and I now see the Epic Game Store is giving away Civilization VI for free. Do you take this as further confirmation that the Epic Game Store is out to aggravate you personally and damn the cost? Best, Sam. So, no, I actually think it worked. Like, I'm not... Everybody was worried I'd be all salty that, you know, I just bought the game and then the game is free. But it actually worked out fine. Uh, you remember, Paul, last week I said, you know, if it gave me a coupon to get the Civ 6 with all DLC for 40 bucks. Yeah. And the version they're giving away on the Epic Game Store is the game without the DLC. And if you want to buy all the DLC, it's about 40 bucks. So, <laughs> so it's... Uh -huh. It still worked out for me. I, you could think of it as I got the game for free and then paid forty dollars for the DLC. Either way, it works out. Um, so I still see that as a as a good situation. Yeah, I'm not mad at the Epic Game Store about that. That's fine. A, a lot of people take umbrage when that happens. They're like, "Oh, 
I bought this game and then it was free a, a, a week later. This is an outrage. I'm so angry at them for this was I wasted my money. And it's like, well, if you take that logic, then nobody can put anything on sale ever. <laughs> like, right. what, what do you want them to do? Never put the game on sale, right? There's always going to be somebody buys it just before the sale, and there's even there's even allowances for that. Um, I think even in retail goods, you could you know if you buy something the day before it goes on sale, you can return it and buy it again, or or stores make allowances for it that they'll you know you bring in your receipt and they'll give you the discount basically, you know. Even though you bought it early, I think maybe that depends on the store. That happens sometimes, and you know, it's just, it's just luck. And I don't it's, see uh, it as a. Go ahead. It it does seem it does seem like a, a fairly odd timing though. It was, it was a very interesting timing because I noticed the same thing. The little thing popped up. And it's like Civ Six is now free. I'm like, what? Really? Right. Right. It, it was funny timing, but maybe the two are even related. There's um, there's some new DLC coming out, and maybe all of this is part of a push on the part of Firaxis or whoever to get people to come back and you know grow the audience for the game again, so they'll buy the latest DLC. They're like, okay, we'll do a promotion on our storefront, and we'll put that you know notification in in Civ 5 for people on Steam and we'll do a epic store giveaway so that they get the base game and then they'll want the DLC for it. So it might not be as random as it seems. This, this might all be part of the same marketing push. That would be clever on their part. It would. That's the only reason I think it might not be true. <laughs> Yikes. Let's do one more. Hi, Seamus. Hi, Paul. It's less of a question and more of sharing the news, I suppose. So here's the link on Reddit. Basically, EA is making some parts of the upcoming Command & Conquer remaster open source. And considering that the material they showed previously, I can't help but compare it to the Warcraft 3 Reforged. I'm admittedly a Command & Conquer guy and not really a fan of Blizzard's RTS formula, but I'm still not sure how to feel that Blizzard is stumbling and EA is doing these nice things after CNC4 and Rivals? I just find it so puzzling. I'm not sure why it is happening this way. Maybe you can explain this strange alternate reality. Best regards, Deadly Dark. So yeah, Command & Conquer... See, I don't know how bad Command & Conquer is because I've, I haven't played any Command & Conquer since the first one. But Command & Conquer 4, I, I've heard from fans, I hear them complaining about it, and Rivals, I believe, was the ridiculous mobile game that had nothing to do with Command & Conquer other than brand awareness, you know? It was just like, hey, let's make one of these shitty, shitty, ultimate, low-effort mobile games, but we'll use this incredibly famous IP that we happen to own and slap that on there. I believe that's what that is. <laughs> um, EA, I mean... Yeah, he's doing these nice things. I wonder if they're finally waking up to the reality that, oh well, wow, that shitty mobile game that we put the name Command & Conquer on didn't do that well. Oh wow, our core audience really didn't like Command & Conquer 4. Maybe we should make things that they will like. So maybe this isn't so much them becoming better people, but them realizing that they're making a mistake. Although, making something open source... What is the rationale for that? So after reading the the article, it looks like the, they're making it open source that, to facilitate people adding mods to the game. And that's kind of an interesting thing they're giving away. But this isn't that high of a risk for them. This is what, how old is Command & Conquer? It's at least 20. Oh, yeah. 20, 25 years old. So it's not like they're, you know, open sourcing, you know, Jedi Knight Fallen Order or anything. This isn't, this is a very tiny baby step. Right. For EA. Yeah. This is a low risk project for them. 
Um, so is this like in lieu of creating an API, they're just like, forget it. We're just going to give them open right. source access to the source code. That's exactly what I thought is, oh, it seems like they're being so nice and helpful. But really, the, we were just talking about the, the dangers of, you know, just taking DLLs made by strangers on the internet and putting them on your computer to cheat. Well, the same thing is true of mods. Like, I get real nervous when a mod for a game comes with a DLL, because that thing could do anything. Literally anything. Right. So, and this is them just sort of saying, sure, whatever, um, it's up to you, community. So, rather than making an API, which would allow them to sandbox everything and, you know, oh, we can add modding support via, like we said before, Lewis scripts or whatever. Now, I kind of understand that would take a lot of time and money to set up. So, I understand why EA wouldn't, you know, want to spend that money for a 25-year-old game, for a remaster. But, st so this is still good. This is still a good thing, but it's also them taking the, the path of least resistance. So, I don't know if, uh, if you know, what'll happen to Command & Conquer mods, because I wasn't part of that community back in the day. I don't know what the modding community was like. It's very interesting. I've never though. been uh, involved in Command and Conquer, so I, I'm afraid I can't really offer any input on this. Right. Although it's still I interesting. I did play a lot of mods for Warcraft for Warcraft Three. Uh, I never, well, no, I never made any myself, but uh, that gave that game some real legs for a lot of years. Really? What were the mods like? I never played with with mods. Warcraft 3? Yeah. Uh, that's where, like, tower defense and uh, and uh, defense of the ancients and all those, oh, uh, all those right. genres were developed. Oh, right. Like, I was thinking mods, like, you know, download a DLL type thing, but they had that whole map maker and that whole sort of, like, Quasi programming language going with it. yeah they had yeah, that in StarCraft yeah. too yeah yeah and that was a real modding system it, you know you couldn't just rebuild anything but it did give you quite a bit of sandboxed power yeah you get real close people built whole RPGs and there is basically like custom maps right right but they would have like whole sections of the map that you couldn't get to and then it would like teleport you over there for the next level and stuff like that is it got pretty crazy huh well i mean it's still it's still a step in the right direction for ea this is still a break from their early it's a you could see a change in company philosophy. It's very, very slow, and they have so far to go. But it is one nice thing that they've done. And I'm just a huge believer in open source, especially for old projects that have run their course. Like, how much mileage has the community got out of the Doom source, and the Quake source, and the Quake 2 source? Like, how much education and mods and just amazing things of you know crazy ports that never would have made financial sense but were still fun to do you know the classic get get doom running on your smart refrigerator or something just so much cool <laughs> stuff right. um done because of that sharing of source and so I, I really wish more companies would, would do that. I realize it's, it's probably wildly impractical in modern games. Like, oh, we can't, I mean, we could give you the license, we could give you the source code for Jedi Fallen Order, but, you know, you don't have a license for Unreal Engine, so um, good luck compiling it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, it just, like, so, there's so much um, third-party 
middleware that just giving away the source to the game, even if they were willing to do it, would just be useless to the community. The community would, every individual member of the community would have to like license Source Tree and, and, or Speed Tree and Havoc Physics and Unreal Engine and oh my goodness, it would just make no sense. I just couldn't do yeah. it. They're just too big and complicated. That's a real shame. That's one of the great it advantages is. of Unity is that you can just, anybody can download the Unity uh, dev kit and then you can share Unity source code around and like anybody can play with it. That is a good thing about Unity. I, I know that Unity licensees have access to things that um, freeloaders like I do not. But they have they have the Unity source code. So if your game is so advanced that you change the core of you, if you mess with the Unity source and change the engine itself, you probably won't be able to d distribute. I suppose you could distribute those changes so that other people that have the the fancy commercial license could apply those changes to their their engine. But still, for the vast majority of Unity games, that's fine. That's fine. Not many people mess with the engine. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm uh, I'm interested to see if this is a EA starting a new chapter in in openness and willingness to cooperate with the community, or if it's just them being lazy. <laughs> right. E either one is possible, and in fact, the second one's more likely. And they're like, we were just. We were just sharing the source code because we, we want you to have a sense of pride and accomplishment. <laughs> All right, we have an email left, but I feel like we've done a show, Paul. So we're going to save this one. This person came in at the last minute. They were late. The show was about to start when this email came in. So we will just save it for next week. All right. That's what you get for being late. You know who you are. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. If you have questions for Paul and I, the email is at diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. What? Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, goodbye. I got sucked into Noida again. cool if you could put like all the physics from noida into old games like can you imagine a command and conquer but just like you can set stuff on fire and the whole map is ablaze oh man i think i'm gonna get into command and conquer now